It is my pleasure to actually um, be at the Economic Policy Institute, and I thank Larry and Monique and the entire team at the Economic Policy Institute for the leadership that you have shown for so long on basically educating policymakers, their staff, but uh, particularly the public about the importance of social insurance in this nation uh, generally and social security specifically. I think it's important for us to ground ourselves in the fact that you know, prior to 1935, uh, we did not have uh, Social Security or Medicare, uh, certainly, which came along in 1965. And so we had uh, a, a country that was completely at risk. Uh, there was no pillar of progress like Social Security around. Uh, and if you uh, went through your working years and for heaven forbid you became disabled uh, or you actually um, became so old that you were unable to work, uh, you had nothing to turn to except family members uh, to help you uh, in old age or in the event of a disability. And if you didn't have family members to help you, um, heaven forbid, you were literally on the street begging for alms. Uh, because there was no systematic way to provide income support uh, to you uh, face to an individual worker uh, who faced that kind of circumstance. And so literally, Social Security is one of our nation's great pillars of progress. It is one of the things that, that we have created together to make sure that we provide for workers who who play by the rules, who work hard, and, and basically uh, have something to turn to in old age or in the, in the event of a disability or, heaven forbid, an untimely death of a worker. And so um, it is important that we take this moment to realize how far we have come. Monique has contextualized where we've been in terms of the debate over social insurance generally, but for social security specifically. And there have been multiple attacks on the program uh, throughout time. Uh, certainly the people who were on the losing end of 1935 have never given up their desire to see this program undermined. Uh, and so with that, instead of, and I'm gonna take prerogative as the moderator, Instead of me going first to talk about what I have done in this space, I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleagues here, uh, and then I'll loop around towards the back end uh, to share. Uh, it is absolutely my honor and pleasure uh, to actually introduce to you uh, the people on this panel, starting with Nancy Altman. Uh, Nancy Altman has been so fundamentally integral and important to this movement that you know her expertise, her insight, and her knowledge base are just going to absolutely blow you away. She is the founding co-director of Social Security Works, an organization uh, that has been uh, very important to driving this expansion agenda. Uh, she uh, she is. Uh, a 33, 35 year uh, expert in the area of social insurance and social security and private pensions. Uh, she is the author of The Battle for Social Security from FDR's Vision to Bush's Gamble, and it certainly was a gamble. Uh, she has been on the faculty at Harvard University's Kennedy School. Uh, and whenever you're in a conversation with Nancy, you realize that not only does she walk the walk, she talks the talk because she's actually been in the rooms of the decision-making tables. Uh, and she can actually draw on that experience to actually tell you what was meant by the, the 1981 and 83 reforms. So because in 1982, she was Alan Greenspan's assistant in his position as chairman of the bipartisan commission that developed the 1983 Social Security Amendments. Right after Nancy, uh, we will directly hear from Stephen Hill. Uh, and he is uh, certainly uh, a fellow at the New American Foundation. He's a senior fellow. He's also the Holtz Brink Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. He's the author of six books, including one named Raw Deal, How the Uber Economy and Runaway Capitalism Are Screwing American Workers. But his latest book you can find actually outside. It's called Expand Social Security Now, How to Ensure Americans Get the Retirement They Deserve. And he will be talking to us about this book uh, and coming right up. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Nancy Altman. Maya, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. So many friends and um, colleagues in, in the effort that we all share. I want to elaborate a little bit um, 
over the themes that um, Monique and Maya touched on. For, the, for too long, really for decades, the debate over Social Security has been biased. It's been based on a false premise. The premise that was sort of conventional wisdom among the elites, which trickled down to everyone else, was that somehow the wealthiest nation in the world at the wealthiest moment in history could not afford the modest benefits that Social Security provides. It was just common, everybody knew we couldn't afford Social Security, it was bankrupting us, we had to cut it. And when you frame the debate that way, you're not gonna get much action because polling shows that 90, about 90% 90 of the American people don't want it cut, and for good reason. That it, as um, Maya said, it fills a basic need, a basic floor of economic security. So the, the question was, well, how could, we, how could they do this? And they tried you know, the super committee and the Bull Simpson committee and all of these fast track, undemocratic, let's go behind closed doors, as they often said, hold hands and jump off, you know, jump off together. So no one, so there's no accountability. And fortunately, the, our system doesn't work that way. And the people in this room and a lot of people outside shined a spotlight on what was going on and, and stopped those um, movements. At the same time, though, that's, people started correcting the record. Um, and again, the people at this, on this panel, but many people in the audience and many people outside to make the point that Social Security doesn't add a penny to the deficit. So why are we talking about it in terms of the deficit? To say that, GDP, that Social Security's benefits are modest by virtually any standard and it is more efficient than virtually any, than, I shouldn't say virtually, than any other retirement system program you're gonna see. It's less than a penny of every dollar gets spent on administration. So it's extremely efficient, it's extremely modest, and indeed, be, as a point when the population is growing from 12% to 20%, the senior population, as Monique said, because benefits are being cut, the, the um, cost of Social Security out for 75 years and beyond is, is a straight horizontal line. At its most expensive, it will be and this is in 2090, according to the latest trustees report that came out last week. In 2090, it'll be its most expensive. It will be 6.1% of GDP. Now, Germany, I think, spends about 11% of its GDP today on its old age survivors and disability benefits. Same with Austria, same with France, same with Japan. Yeah, I mean, you can go through the list. So there's no question we can afford it. The question is, uh, the issue is one of values and choice. It's not affordability. And as soon as that message broke through, and part of what helped that message break through indeed was the idea that now people, really starting with Maya, um, could see concrete proposals that expanded benefits, no cuts, fully funded them, restored Social Security to long range balance. Um, as soon as people started talking about let's expand Social Security. And as soon as it became prominent people like Elizabeth Warren and Sherrod Brown and Tom Harkin and Bernie Sanders and Elijah Cummings and the Congressional Progressive Caucus and Lots and Jan Schakowsky and so many others, that all of a sudden it, it's, it's like, wait, I thought it was going bankrupt. If we can expand it, then it's not going bankrupt. And if they can show us these intelligent people are telling us this, and that made the debate it's just beginning, but I think it's making the debate much more an honest one. Now the question is, do we expand Social Security? Do we keep at the level it is but fully fund it? Or do we cut um, the benefits? And that, you know, that's a balanced question. Now I feel quite confident if the um, legislators, if the Democratic Party throws down the gauntlet and, and stands behind um, an expand package, and really puts the Republicans on the defensive. So it's not behind closed doors. There's not this holding hands. So it's really gonna be fun um, to see. So an important part was um, correcting the, the, the record, and that's still going on. You know, we still hear it's fiscally irresponsible, it's robbing our children. I mean, there are all kinds of phony arguments that are being put forward that we still have to 
beat down. Um, there are what I call zombie lies, that there's no trust fund and the money's all been spent. The first time somebody said it was worthless IOUs was Alf Landon in 1936. The first group that, that refuted this concept was an advisory council in 1938 that disagreed on a lot of things, but they were, uni they were unified in the statement they put out. So we've got to keep doing this. There's too much, as Maya said, there are the uh, people who were defeated um, in 1935 and in 1965, and are um, and they are some of them are um, their um, spiritual heirs. Some of their are their direct descendants. Um, George W. Bush's grandfather famously said, "The the only person I've ever hated lies buried in Hyde Park, which of course is where FDR is buried." Um, so some of them and the Koch brothers too. Their grandfather was in Texas railing against the New Deal. So there's and there's a lot of money um, on that side. But we've got truth on our side and we've got the American people on our side. So the, and, and I think what's becoming clear, and I think it was the AFL-CIO, I'm looking at Gail, that first used this language, that social security is not a problem, it's not in crisis. Social security is a solution. It was an executive council of the AFL-CIO that I think first used that language, and it's true. It's a solution to the retirement income crisis. It's a solution to the squeeze on working families. It's a solution to income and wealth inequality. So there's, it's a strong, as I like to say, it's wise policy and it's winning politics. Um, so some of it was, um, is, is getting the facts out and showing just how efficient, how universal, how secure, how fair social security is. It's how portable, I mean it is, it has so many pluses, it's add-on benefits that you cannot find in the private sector, like complete cost of living adjustment, although we have to make that more accurate um, and make, because it's undermeasures inflation at this point. Add-on benefits, for example, for divorced spouses that don't undercut the worker's benefit. It's got all of these advantages. If we are going to do something about retirement income and even the right says we've got to do something, they want to do it through 401ks. But our answer is, good, let's take that money and put it in Social Security because that's the, the system, not the 401k system, that really is universal and helps all working families. So Maya really set the table with, and, and made the important point that we are be fast becoming a majority-minority country. And it would be, I don't know what the strongest, I mean, ironic is the weakest word you can say. It would be outrageous if as we're turning majority minority, that after people have been paying in and earning these benefits for years, we turn around and cut them. That would be an outrage. What we need to do is expand them. So Maya did a wonderful job educating us and showing us the path. My co-director, Eric Kingston, and I um, put together a, a book that showed different um, that you can increase benefits, but we should also be adding benefits. The idea of paid family leave, the idea of sick leave, fit within the concept of Social Security wage insurance. It's a time when wages are lost, when your costs go up. So it's a, it's a sh you can think of it as a kind of short-term disability to go with long-term. So those are kinds of benefits we should be thinking about. Um, but when Eric and I finished, after our, the book was out, we looked at each other and said, you know, we really, we thought we were trying to do the left edge, but we really were not, we weren't thinking big enough. We weren't thinking bold enough. And so I was delighted when Stephen Hill came out with his book that is the bold vision I think we need. So with that, I will turn it over to Stephen.